Let's pray. Gracious Lord, you have brought us together this morning to bless you, to praise you, and to worship you. And we do that because you are who you are. But we also do it, Lord, because we know that you have done great things in and among us. And so we ask that as we gather here this morning, that our hearts would truly be turned toward you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. During the prelude this morning, please spend some time in prayer and in meditation. Take a look at those passages of Scripture that we'll be using this morning. The first one is our call to worship. That's Psalm 111. Spend some time meditating on the words there. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter, uh, the sermon will be coming from verses 12 through 17. And as you read those words, invite God to speak to your heart. Thank you, Benny. Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 111, and I'll read verse 1, and all of you respond uh, with verse 2, and we'll, we'll go through the chapter that way, after I find it. Praise the Lord! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Full of honor and majesty is his work, 
and his righteousness endures forever. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Amen. Now if you take your hymn books and turn to number 71 and meditate as Bunny plays. This morning comes from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 12. And I'll read through verse 17. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Let's pray. Gracious God, we ask, first of all, that we would understand your good works in our lives, in your word, and in this world. We ask that you would fill us this morning with insight and understanding as we look at this passage from your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew assumes that his readers know all about why John the Baptist has been arrested and put in prison. And so he doesn't get around to telling us that story until chapter 14. Unfortunately for John, in addition to being a baptizer, he was also a hellfire and damnation prophet. And it turns out that John had become rather prophetic with King Herod. And John had spoken out against King Herod because of his quirky marriage status. That criticism earned John a trip to prison, and it ultimately ended up with John having an appointment 
with the royal head remover, which he did not survive at all. Head removal will do that for a person. Suffice it to say, though, that even with his imprisonment before his appointment, that John the Baptist's voice had been silenced. The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, was no longer being heard in the land. The Baptist's work of preparation for the coming of the Lord had been completed. The function of the forerunner is finished. And so Jesus, when he heard that John the Baptist had been put in prison, moved into the province of Galilee. Galilee is in the northern part of the nation of Israel. It is the area that immediately surrounds the Sea of Galilee. Nazareth, which was Jesus' hometown when he was a boy, is also located in Galilee. But Matthew tells us that when Jesus became a man, that he did not stay in Nazareth. In fact, Matthew tells us in this passage that he left there. Nazareth would certainly have been very familiar to Jesus, and Jesus would certainly have been very familiar to Nazareth. But sometimes, as the old saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. And in Jesus' relationship with the folks in Nazareth, this was absolutely the situation. It was difficult for the folks living in Nazareth, Nazareth to accept the fact that the carpenter's son could also be a very popular and insightful preacher. And one time when Jesus was the guest speaker at the synagogue in Nazareth, his preaching so enraged the townspeople they very nearly killed him. So, given the circumstances, it is probably just as well that Jesus decided not to stay in Nazareth. Instead, he made his home in Capernaum, which is located right on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it is likely that it is also the home of some of the fishermen who will eventually become Jesus' disciples. Jesus may have been from Nazareth, but from the point of view of the Gospels, Capernaum was his home. We're not really sure why Jesus chose to make his home in Capernaum, but as Matthew writes his gospel, it becomes for Matthew a matter of the fulfillment of prophecy. Prophecy and the fulfillment of it is very important to Matthew. Often in Matthew's gospel, he will insert a phrase that sounds pretty much like this. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. And then he'll name the prophet, just like he does in verse 14 of our passage today. And so Matthew takes us back to Isaiah chapter 9. Often, when a writer of the scripture quotes to us from a particular portion of the Bible, their intent is for us to go back to that portion and to read everything around it to read the whole thing, to connect with the whole thing. And, and chapter 9 of Isaiah ought to sound a little bit familiar to all of us. 
much of Isaiah chapter 9 is used at Christmas time. It contains those wonderful verses that Handel put to music in the Messiah. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests on his shoulder, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Can't you just hear that glorious and majestic music even now as I drone away? But the part of Isaiah chapter 9 that Matthew is most interested at this particular moment is the part that he quotes. By the time that Matthew is writing, Zebulun and Naphtali are ancient and forgotten history. Nobody in Jesus' day referred to their region as the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. For instance, some of you know that St. George is made up of three villages. And most of you could easily name two of them without much difficulty. But there are also several smaller, less significant regions in St. George. Meg and I live in Smalley Town. Karis lives in Martinsville. But can anyone pinpoint, except for maybe Quincy, Elmore any longer? Probably not. Elmore like Zebulun and Naphtali, has passed out of memory for most people. But in the 8th century BC, the region in and around Galilee was called Zebulun and Naphtali. And in the 8th century BC, the armies of the Assyrians attacked that area and plowed that region back into an uninhabited wasteland. And Isaiah, in his prophetic vision, says that one day light is going to dawn in that area and that the judgment of the Lord against his people will be lifted. And God chose to bring that light to the region of Galilee by coming there himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, the very light of the world. And Jesus began his ministry of hope and redemption in a land that had been plunged into darkness because of the judgment and punishment of God. And for Matthew, that is just about the most awesome thing that he can imagine. God's judgment of darkness is lifted by God's love and forgiveness by his own Son, who is the light of the world. And that ought to be incredibly awesome to us as well. And it ought to be awesome to us because we too often choose the path of darkness and sin in our lives over the path of redemption and life. And when we sin, we put ourselves under the judgment of God. We do not merely stumble into that place of darkness, but rather, we walk there intentionally and purposefully, knowing full well the consequences of our actions. And so, as Jesus began his ministry, in a region and among a people that had been plunged into darkness, 
he began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. We like to believe that the word repent is an old-fashioned, old-timey word uh, that has passed out of significance in our enlightened world. It conjures up images of old-time evangelistic preachers who whipped their hearers into a frenzy of sorrow and wailing and deep sorrow for sins committed. The result of all of that ferocious preaching was that the poor souls who heard it were frightened into repentance as they were nearly convinced by the fear instilled in them that the putrid fires of hell were already licking at their backsides. Jesus' message is also one of the need to repent. But notice, though, the not-so-subtle difference in the message that Jesus preaches. Jesus speaks not of the encroaching fires of hell, but rather of the nearness of the kingdom of heaven. When we repent, it is not because we fear hell, but rather it is because we welcome the one who is bringing the light of the kingdom of heaven to us. Matthew says, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And this light of heaven comes to us at the pleasure and the choosing of Almighty God. This light is a bright and hopeful message that God's wrathful judgment has been lifted. Our Lord preached a message of God's love for all of the people of this world. So then, what does it mean to repent? Basically, it means to change our minds about God. It means to learn that God truly does love us. It means to dispense with the foolish notions that we maintain about God's wrath and judgment and willingness to smite us at, a slightest, at the slightest provocation. It means to believe, as Jonah did, that God is a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. But it also means that we will cherish this about God, not despise it, as Jonah did. But repentance also means that we will stop dead in our tracks, turn around and put the fires of hell at our backsides and the kingdom of heaven fully in our forward vision. It means that we will not walk knowingly into places of darkness, but rather that we will constantly seek out the light of God's kingdom. As he prepared the way for the soon arrival of Jesus in the beginning of his ministry, John the Baptist said, bear fruit that is worthy of repentance. John didn't exactly spell out for us what that meant, but when he began his ministry, Jesus himself made that very clear. And he spelled that out inside of that infamous synagogue in Nazareth. It was a dangerous thing for Jesus to do because the people there, as we know, nearly killed him. Jesus said, 
that the work of the kingdom of God, the bearing of fruit that is worthy of repentance, is the bringing of good news to the poor, the proclaiming of release to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Doing these things is bearing fruit that is worthy of repentance. What will it take for us to believe this? What will it take for us to join Jesus in doing it? Let's pray. Help us, O oh God, to always bear fruit that is worthy of repentance. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for that incredible work of yours that lifts judgment from us and reminds us of your love and peace and strength. We come to you this morning asking that you would be with Sarah and her husband, as she is in the hospital, we ask for healing and strength and peace for her. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The announcements are in your bulletin. Um, we now have two volleyballs to send to Operation Planning Hope. Uh, thank you for those who provided for them. Um, we're all set now with everything that we need, and Meg will be boxing that stuff up soon, probably. Or, okay. And uh, Women's Group is now duly accessible, and uh, they're hoping that uh, many of you um, who, who haven't joined in person before will We'll join by Zoom. And, um, the Shooks aren't here this morning, but Rudy had an announcement about the uh, the uh, team shelter, and uh, he wanted to thank everybody for all of the efforts that they'd made this month um, in getting things together for the team shelter. Um, on Tuesday, he was able to take almost a, a full pickup truck load um, over, and uh, we got an immediate thank you note um, from the shelter um, that I could have shared with you this morning. Um, so he, they're very grateful for everything uh, that we've been doing for them. Um, and we have some local needs here in our own congregation. And so you'll, Meg has put a, a basket at the back. I think you're the one that did it, right, dear? For the Deacon's Fund? Yes. So um, if you would like to make a donation to the Deacon's Fund, I think we'll just leave it up there all the time on account that your current pastor um, can't remember to mention it on, on uh, uh, while he's laughing because he uses that line all the time. <laughs> Your current pastor um, <laughs> forgets to mention it on, on uh, Communion Sunday. And uh, so it'll be there all the time, I think, now. And, and uh, if you want to donate, please do that. Let's hear the doxology.
Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for inviting us into your kingdom. Thank you for reminding us this morning of the profound worth of your kingdom and the importance of our participation in it. And so this morning we give you our lives and we give you our wallet. And we ask that you would be pleased with our offering. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go forth in the strength of the Lord. Amen.